Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. Welcome to this week's episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. We're going to be getting started in just a minute. I'm so excited for my guest tonight, Christy Wright. We're going to be talking about her book, Business Boutique, and we're going to be talking about how you can do what you love and make money, imagine that, while you're doing it. So it's going to be a lot of fun. This is an episode you're not going to want to miss, and you're going to want to share this with your friends. So let me just encourage you to take just a minute and go ahead and share it with your friends, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Periscope. Just hit that share button and get us out there to them. I'm going to just take a second, make sure I've got everything going. I see over here on Periscope, I'm even seeing some hearts. Fantastic. I'm looking over here to the side to my webcam. And i got to do something here that's going to fix my notes. Okay, good enough. Guys, here's what question I want to ask. Uh, where are you watching from? So let me know. I'm in Franklin, Tennessee tonight, which is beautiful weather. It's kind of been overcast all day. We've had rain off and on, but a beautiful summer day. I guess technically it's late spring, not summer, but a great time of year. I'm going to go here over here to my comment cam and just look at some of the comments that are coming in because I want to hear from you guys. And I want to make sure that we're live on Facebook because my thing is not updating. Do you see us on there, Matt? I see it on YouTube. And I see it on Periscope. So somebody on Periscope says it's freezing up on my end. What you got to do there is just refresh. If that's not working for you, just go ahead and refresh it. Yeah, I wonder if that stream key didn't get in quite right. Let's see if I can fix it real quick. Okay. Periscope's all good. Thanks for that report. YouTube looks okay, but not a for Facebook. We'll see if we get it fixed here. I wonder if we should start over. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering too. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Hey guys, sorry for this, but be patient with us. We're going to start over. So stay tuned. We just got to get it working on Facebook here. Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. Take two. I'm hoping this is going to work. I'm looking at Facebook right now because we weren't on Facebook a moment ago, but I think we're on now. Um, Matt's giving me the high sign here. Are we on YouTube? Yes. Periscope? Not so sure about Periscope. We might have lost that one. I think we're, I see a feed. You see a feed? Uh -huh. Okay. I'm going to assume that we're on. Guys, welcome to the Michael Hyatt Show. I appreciate your patience. We couldn't get Facebook started. We made an error on our side, but it's all fixed. That's just part of the live technology, part of the fun of doing this. So tonight, I'm so excited because I'm going to be interviewing my very special guest, Christy Wright. Christy works with Dave Ramsey. She's read a new book called Business Boutique, and it's all about how you can do what you love and get this, get paid for it. This is going to be an episode that not only do you not want to miss, but you're going to want to share it with your friends. So let me encourage you, whatever platform you're watching on right now, whether it's Periscope or YouTube or Facebook, 
please hit the share button. Share this out. We'd love to get as many people as we possibly can. I asked this question before, but because we weren't on Facebook, I didn't get an answer. So I'm going to ask it now. Um, where are you watching from? And I'm watching from Franklin, Tennessee. Beautiful weather here. But where are you guys watching from? All right, I'm seeing on YouTube, Kristen from Asheville, North Carolina. She also says, love Christy Wright's book. Stephanie on YouTube, I'm so excited. I saw her at Dave Ramsey's Summit. Um, yeah, so that's cool. And here on Facebook, oh my gosh, Rogelio from Mexico, Michelle from Chicago, James from Moreno Valley, California, Chris Cook from Detroit, Kent Hicks from Dallas, Maria from Langhorn, PA, Benita Schrader calling from, or watching from Northwest Illinois, Mike Cunningham from Atlanta. They're scrolling so fast here, I can't keep up. Okay, I want to go back and I want to ask you another question, which is this. If you could start a business today and know for sure that it would be successful, what business would you launch? Okay? Now, I'm going to answer first to give you a time to go ahead and think about it and answer in the comments area. If I was going to start a business today, and if I knew that it couldn't fail, it would be the business that I'm in. I love what I'm doing. You know, this is my dream job. I get to work with the most amazing people. We have about 20 people, full-time uh, teammates, and we have a blast. And I'm just so grateful that I get to come to work every day and work with them and get to talk to people like you. So what would it be for you? Let me just go back here again to Facebook. So we got people checking in and saying where they're calling from. Matt, I'm still not getting Periscope to work, but maybe that's just going to be how it's going to be. Madeline um, confirmed that it is on. So. Oh, it is on. Good. Well, maybe I'm just not seeing it. Well, that's okay. So Beautiful Horizons on YouTube, she just said, oh my gosh, Christy is awesome. How exciting. Yeah, Nancy Cullen said, what I'm doing now, repurposing, rehabbing houses, and writing stories. Sue writes, it's uh, ceramics. Dana said, same here, living my dream job. Isn't that amazing? I mean, guys, we live in the most amazing time in history. I really think that's the case. Where because of the internet, because of all the technology and the networking, it's possible and easier than ever before to start a business and to be successful at it. It's not easy but it's easier than it's ever been before. So we got about a minute left in the pre-show. We're just giving people a chance to get on, and then we're gonna to get to your questions all through this, uh, broadcast this interview with Christy Wright. So be sure in the comments to give me your questions. I'm not gonna wait till the end of the interview to ask your questions. I'm gonna be doing it all the way through the interview. So if Christy says something that makes you curious or you wanna dive deeper, ask a question, and I'll make sure that I get it to her. So another question. About 30 seconds left. What has gotten in the way of your own entrepreneurial aspirations? And I'll just tell you, for me, for years I struggled with fear because I went through a business failure in the early 1990s and that kind of left me scarred. And it took me a while before I had the confidence to again launch out on my own. But what's gotten in your way of your own uh, entrepreneurial aspirations? Okay, I'm going to go back over here. Nancy said, just found a housekeeper, yard guy, and a project helper, so relieved. Karen Fowler Merritt says, fear. Dana says, self-doubt. And kids, doubting your kids or those two different things? I'm guessing those are two different things. Um, yeah, over here on YouTube, Beautiful Horizon said, I'm really enjoying content creation. I would like to keep pursuing this. I have dreams of eBooks, products, and business collaboration. Fear is definitely a factor that holds me back. So guys, we are definitely going to get to the fear part of the equation. That's key. So pre-show's over. Let me go ahead and start. We all want to thrive in our careers, right? We want to flourish financially while doing work we love. But there seem to be so many roadblocks along the way. And this is especially true for women in business. I've got five daughters. I've seen this up close and personal. The cultural norms seem to be stacked against women for their success. But what if I told you that the key to shattering the glass ceiling is to build a business without a glass ceiling? 
Well, tonight's guest, Christy Wright, is the creator of Business Boutique, and through her podcast and sell-out live events, Christy has equipped thousands of women to successfully start and grow a business so they can make money, get this, doing what they love. And she's here tonight to help you do the same. Hello, I'm Michael Hyatt. Welcome to my live show where each week I talk with a different thought leader about some aspect of personal development, productivity, or leadership. And my goal is to help you win at work, succeed at life, and lead with confidence. Let's get started. Both entertaining and inspiring, Krista Wright presents messages that educate and give hope to audiences nationwide. She's a certified business coach, a Ramsey personality, and since joining Dave Ramsey Solutions in 2009, she's spoken to audiences across the country at women's conferences, national business conferences, and Fortune 500 companies. And her new book, Business Boutique, provides the plan you need to turn your passion into a thriving business. Christy. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Absolutely. I don't remember where you were speaking, but a couple of my daughters were in your audience, and suddenly I started getting this flurry of texts. And they said, <laughs> Dad, you have got to connect with Christy. She's amazing. So uh, well, congratulations you for, for all your success. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to start with this question. We'll take questions, guys. If, if, for those of you that are watching, please enter your questions in the comments. We'll get to them as we go along. But for entrepreneurs, why is it so important to build a business that reflects our greatest passions? You know, that's a great question. And I would say it's two parts. It's part for you and part for your customers. Well, for you, you want to spend your life doing what you love. You know, Michael, I don't know if you know this, but I heard a statistic recently that's pretty sad. 70% of Americans don't like their job. Now, you spend a lot of time at work, in your job, or in your business, to be doing something you don't like. It makes it that much harder to leave your house and leave your family for something you don't like to do. So part of the equation is for you, so you can spend your life doing what you love to do. But the other part of the equation is for your customers, those people that you're serving. Because when you love what you're doing, they feel it. The marketplace can sense it when you're in your sweet spot and you're truly passionate about what you're doing. So it's a win-win when you're doing what you love. I love that. You know, I was watching today uh, Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. I'm a little bit of a geek that way. And they were introducing all these new products. And I know it's, it's hard work working at Apple, but it's clear to me that they absolutely love what they're doing. I think that's the one thing that uh, Steve Jobs left his mark on the company. It's clear that he loved it. And because he loved it, it was a huge benefit to, to his customers like me. Right. Well, it's interesting, too, because in the business boutique business plan that I created in the book, the very first step of the whole plan is why. I want you to identify why do you do it. And it's really what we're talking about of, of why do you love it? Why does this matter to you? Because what I've found, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, Michael, in coaching entrepreneurs, but why you do it will always affect how you do it. You put a different level of passion into every detail of your work when you really believe in it. So why you do it affects how you do it. And I know uh, you probably have heard of Simon Sinek and his book, Start With sure. Why, but he also says that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So we better know why we do it, do it also for our marketing. So your why affects so many different aspects of your business. It's really important to love what you're doing. I, I love that because I find in working with entrepreneurs that the first question they ask is how. And a lot of people get stuck right. at how right. because they're not clear on the what and they're not clear right. on the why. And those questions right. come before it, the how. In fact, in my experience, the how shows up if you know what you want to do and why you're doing it. Have you seen that too? It's, it's so true. And I've had women come to our business boutique events that have successful businesses. So they're already in the builder phase. They've had a business or maybe even team members for a year or three years or five years, but they never identified their how. And when they step back and take a moment to identify their how, there's a whole new level of energy that's injected into their business and passion for their work and their output. And it really kind of creates uh, what Dave Ramsey has done so well at our company is this crusade mentality. 
you can't not do it because you believe in it so much. So even if you've already been in business, I encourage you to go back and think through, what is your why? Why does this matter to you? Because it will affect so many different aspects of what you're doing. So true. Okay, I wanna put out the role kind of a, of a skeptic and ask you this, okay. is it possible to earn money doing what we love, even if our particular passion uh, doesn't fit a traditional business context? You know, it's a really great question, and you were talking a second ago about what a great time this is. So we live in a world where starting a business is easier than ever before. So the barrier to entry into the marketplace is lower than ever before. You can dip your toe in the water with very low risk and very low cost. And so it's a great time to try some things out. But what you can do is you can actually evidence your passions in many different ways. So, uh, for example, I worked with one woman that was a teacher. And she had been a professional teacher for many years and decided to go out on her own. But she really loved organizing. Well, she decided to combine those two things. And now she has a business where she does professional organizing for teachers in their classrooms. So there are so many creative ways for you to take your skills and your passions and your strengths and turn those into different businesses. It doesn't have to be a traditional route or a traditional business model. You can get really creative and five, find ways to use your gifts and your strengths in the business world and serve the marketplace as well. You know, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, I think the internet has made that a lot of that possible to really niche down on, a, on something really specialized and for people to be able to find you. Like if I were you know, to open a store that taught people, taught teachers how to get organized and opened it in Franklin, Tennessee, and I wasn't on the internet, I mean, the chances of that business succeeding would be slim to none. But because of the exactly internet, right. because would, people can search for it, yeah. Well, and with social media and you've got free marketing platforms, you've got website templates that are so cheap, it's really easy to get started. You even have incubator sites, little business incubator sites like Etsy mm -hmm. or things like that. And so what you can do is you have exposure to the entire world with very low cost. And it's a great time to be able to do that where you're testing some things out to see what works and see what sticks. And again, the risk is low, the barrier to entry is low, and the cost is very, very low. Yeah, it's kind of like failure is underrated. You know, I think for many of us, you know, failure is just a faster way to get to what it is you need to be doing. You know, if everything worked, I'd probably be stuck in a boring job, but it doesn't work. And so I fail my way to success by trying a lot of things, being experimental, and then finally, you know, kind of settling into my groove, something that meets the market's uh, needs and also gives me the ability to express my passion. Well, I love that you said that because so many people think of failure as a negative. Now, granted, it's not fun, okay? I don't <laughs> think you would admit that it's fun. I don't, you know, I admit it's not fun. I, uh, there's a certain uh, story I tell at my events of a time when I completely bombed speaking, Michael. Like, I mean, cried the whole way home from this speaking event. And that failure was not fun. I would not like to recreate that or relive that. But the truth is it taught me something. And even though I drove home that entire way from that event, telling myself never again, I'll never speak again. I'll never walk on a stage again. I'll never put myself out there. You do learn over time and over failing and falling and getting back up that failure is just a stepping stone in the journey to success. So you begin to see yes. failure actually as a positive. And I love the quote by Michael Jordan, who's you know the greatest basketball player of all time. He says, I have lost 300 games in my career. I have uh, missed uh, 90 shots. I have 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed. You know, Babe Ruth was the strikeout king and the home run king. So you can't have one without the other and it helps us reframe failure as a positive, as the stepping stone in the journey. Those are perfect examples. Why is entrepreneurship a powerful path for women in particular? Well, it's exactly what we're talking about. There's never been a better time to do it. And you know, it's interesting because so many women are highly educated, highly skilled. They have passions and strengths and talents, but they want flexibility. They want flexibility to be with their family. They wanna make money from home. They wanna build their business around their life versus their life around their business. And like we're talking about, there's never been a better time to do it. And so it really gives you so much freedom and control and options and flexibility to not only do what you love, but build this business around your life where you can have more flexibility to spend time with your family, to be present for field trips or soccer games or some of these things. And uh, what a great time to do it where you truly can have both. Yeah, I, I just love that. I mean, I, I mentioned to you, I've got five daughters. All of them are very entrepreneurial. Um, one of them works for me. 
One of them is in the process of starting a business. Three of them are in businesses. And they have enormous flexibility. You know, they're, they're there with their kids. They're able to invest in their families in a different way, but actually do work that they love. And I, I think this may be the first generation that's ever, that's ever been true of. And it's so great for women. Well, certainly it's the first generation where this is so easy, like we're saying. And so yeah. you don't have to have these separate lives where you leave and you go and you clock out and you clock in and you can start to integrate your lives and have different parts of yourself that you don't feel like your heart is torn in multiple competing directions. Certainly you need to have focus and be present in these different areas. But you know, for example, I bring my son with me um, on trips when I go travel and speak and you just find ways to be creative. Sometimes I'll work from home on the back deck writing while my sons are playing in the yard. And so you get really creative and you have more options than you ever have before. That's so awesome. Look, if you guys are finding this helpful, again, I wanna encourage you to share this. Don't be selfish, share this out, invite your friends to come listen to it. You're going to hear some more wisdom and some more great answers from Christy. And we've got some questions that are coming in. So I want to go over to the comment cam here. And we've got a question on Facebook from Karen Fowler Merritt, who asked, Hi, Christy. I just launched a blog in March, a lifestyle blog. I love making cold processed soaps and other beauty products, but the market seems oversaturated. Should I be going in another direction, making money through my blog? I love doing both. Do you have any advice for her, Christy? That's such a great question. And I'll tell you, Michael, I have been asked this question so many times. So I recently launched the book Business Boutique. And whenever we were on book tour, we went around to different book signings. So they were at Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. And I'm sure you've experienced this as well. And so I'm standing there at the book signing and I would do like a question and answer at the end. And inevitably, I got asked this question is the market too saturated? I do graphic design or I do organizing or I'm a massage therapist or fill in the blank with whatever the thing is. And is the market too saturated? Now, this is my perspective and, and feel free to chime in here, Michael, if you disagree. But as they're asking me this question, I looked around and I said, look around you. I said, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of books in this bookstore right now, but you're holding mine. And the reason I believe that's true is because I believe God has given me a market to serve and to help in a way that only I can. But the same is true for you. There's a group of people that only you can help because only you have your, have your unique talent and skills and strengths and style and voice and experience and perspective. Only you have this combination of factors that you bring to the marketplace and the customers that you serve. So even if a bunch of people are doing soaps or organizing or whatever your thing is, that doesn't take away from what God wants to do through you. So I just encourage you to dig into not only what your why is, but what your unique position is. When you find what makes you unique, that you want to serve the marketplace and make yourself stand apart, then that's not going to, there's nothing that can stop you from serving those people well. So just identify what makes you unique and remember that God has something special that only you can do. Man, I totally agree with that. In fact, I would be nervous if there wasn't somebody else doing what I want to do in the marketplace. When there's competition in the marketplace, it really validates the concept. And I, get, right. I used to get asked all the time when I was a publisher, somebody wanted to write a book on, on marriage, and they say, you know, there's so many books on marriage. What could I possibly say? And just as you said, there's never been a book on marriage written by you, filtered through right. your unique experiences, with your unique voice, with your unique perspective, and the world needs that. So, yeah, That's right. I couldn't agree with you more. My friend um, Jessica says, no one can execute on your dream like you can. And I love that quote. No one can execute on your dream like you can. And so just remembering that helps you kind of press forward, good. even though there may be other people doing it. That's tweetable. Okay. Caitlin Stewartson <laughs> on Facebook asked, I live, this is a great question. I live in a rural community and in the country, middle of nowhere. My location makes building a business extremely difficult. Do you have any insight into how I can work around this? Well, the location only affects if you're doing an in-person business. So if you were doing in-person services like uh, voice lessons or swim lessons, or if you had a brick and mortar store or in-person products, what we're talking about, Michael, is with the flexibility of social media and online businesses, you have exposure to millions and millions, billions of people that can be your customers. So I just encourage you to think outside the box. In this case, the box is your location. Uh, and just think online. How can you use your skills and talents and gifts online? Not only can you get outside of your area, but you can make that much more of an impact because you think about this video right here that Michael and I are on is going to have a huge impact, way more people than he and I could serve 
in person. And so think totally. outside the box and think about an online format for your business. You know, as I was reading this question, I thought, you know, this happens to us all, we get this limiting belief. And the limiting belief yeah. is I live in the middle of nowhere, so I can't possibly do a business. What if that actually was your advantage? Because you might be tempted, if you didn't live out in the middle of, of nowhere, to start a retail business that wouldn't have as much reach, but because you're in the middle of nowhere, you're having to build a business that could have global reach. So uh, you might want to reframe that as an advantage, not something that limits you. Just a thought. That's great. Okay, okay I got another question here. Gosh, they're pouring in. Uh, this one from Facebook also, uh, Dana Sachtelin, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, ask, hi Christy, I met you and Dave in Irvine in January and your advice was great. I'm starting to get coaching clients through my radio show with my co-host and was wondering how I should go about starting this partnership, financially speaking, before we start making the big bucks. Love the confidence. That's a great question. I love the confidence as well. I'll tell you now, Dave is kind of a stickler on this. I'm going to tell you kind of what we teach when it comes to partnerships. We really recommend that you find ways to do business with others without going into business with others. In fact, there are very few benefits to having a legal partnership as a business structure, um, but you can certainly find ways to do business together. Uh, you just wanna be really, really clear on the front end from the financial standpoint, everything's in writing, everything's agreed upon, all the expectations are set, and I would revisit that frequently as you have different levels of income or maybe different streams of income from different outlets to revisit that. That's something that should be an ongoing conversation, but I certainly recommend that you guys do business together without going into business together. Really, truly, it's not worth it, and often those um, breakups, when they do happen between partnerships, can be really expensive and complicated, and it just wasn't worth it. So certainly set the expectations on the front end from the financial standpoint of who, get what, who gets what and how much and when as you scale, uh, but, but I would not recommend a partnership business structure. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that too, and I've paid the stupid tax on this one a couple of times, and it's never worth it. Thankfully, the people I was in partnership are still good friends to this day. But I, I just agree with you. You know, and I, I like what Brene Brown says, better to have the hard conversation on the front end than experience regret on the back end. And I've been there so yes. many times. Okay, Absolutely. I want to turn just to you for a minute and kind of get into your story a little bit. But you first became inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit when your mom opened her own cake shop. Can you tell us just a little right. bit about that? Sure. Well, I actually don't remember those early days, but I've heard the story so many times, and it's certainly the backdrop to my whole childhood. So I was um, six months old when my mom started a little cake shop, and she was newly single, a newly single mom, and she had this baby to raise and support. And so she got kind of scrappy, like a lot of entrepreneurs are, a little resourceful, and kind of went into survival mode. And she started this cake shop because she had always decorated cakes back when she was like 16. She worked in this little bakery. And she went back to something she had always known, something she had always loved, which is a common phrase I hear from women I coach. You know, I had always loved sewing. I had always loved design. I had always loved math and numbers. And that was true from my mom. And so she went back to something she'd always known and loved and uh, started this little bakery. And it grew into um, a large organization. She had 15 team members. And I was raised in the cake shop, literally at times, like, sleeping on flour sacks and sugar bags. Uh, before I'd go to school, we'd go down there at two and three and four in the morning before um, I went to school when she had to bake. And um, I just have countless memories in this cake shop. But I'll tell you that watching my mom uh, use her gifts, watching my mom pursue her passions, watching my mom serve the marketplace and be a go-getter and work really hard and uh, you know fall down, but get herself back up and dust herself off and be so persistent is what shaped me into who I am. So I didn't have a mom that taught me work ethic. I had a mom that lived it. And as she lived it mm. out in front of me, that's what shaped me into who I am. And, and now I have work ethic. I am persistent. I persevere. I'm a go-getter. But mom didn't sit me down and say, okay, let's have lessons on how to you know, be a hard worker. She just lived it. And I was right there by her side. And so she's certainly um, my model of what it looks like to be a strong woman using her gifts. And then I went on to pursue a degree in business and became a certified business coach. I started my first little side business myself when I was 23 to help pay the bills. And so uh, that backdrop to the cake shop is kind of what shaped a lot of decisions I made later in life. Certainly even today, I wrote about her in the business boutique book as kind of my inspiration for the business boutique. 
Tell us a little bit about that business that you started when you were 23, your first entrepreneurial <laughs> journey. Sure. Well, I um, was working in a nonprofit and I wasn't making very much money at all, you know, barely getting by. And uh, so I had always had this dream to move to a farm. And I didn't grow up on a farm, by the way, Michael. Didn't know the first thing about caring for horses or animals or fields or bush hogging or any of that. But uh, randomly in Bellevue, which I'm sure you know where Bellevue is, there was a sure. farm that was for rent, rent. And it was 40 acres with this old farmhouse and an 11 stall barn. And I walked into the property. I don't know, just totally on a whim, decided to go rent this place and walked into the property and saw this 11 stall barn and i've always been very entrepreneurial and problem solver and i thought uh oh no problem this rent is three times what i'm paying now and there's no way i can afford it but i'll just start a little business boarding horses and that'll help me pay my rent so that's what i did i used that 11 stall barn and started my first uh side business boarding horses to help me pay my rent and i did it. i moved there i got the horses uh mini donkey fainting goats which i don't know if you've seen fainting goats michael but they're fantastic. Like all of you should just, after this video, YouTube painting goes because they're <laughs> hilarious. I bought them purely for my entertainment and it was worth it all day long. Uh, so I had this incredible farm dream because I started this little side business that made that possible. That is awesome. Um, my oldest daughter, who's the COO of our company, she actually started with horses too, but she wanted horse lessons, but at the time we couldn't afford uh, to pay for those. So she ended up bartering with a lady that she would clean out the stalls, take care of the horses in exchange for lessons. And she's always been entrepreneurial, but that's, horses are a great place to start. I, I gotta ask this question, what has building a business around your passions made possible in your own life? We well, you know, it's just incredible. It shows you what you're capable of. You know, you may love this mm. little hobby and you may paint or you may love horses and you may ride. But when you build a business, it brings out a whole different side of you. It shows you how capable you are, how persistent you can be, how much you can serve people and problem solve and make a difference. Like uh, when I go to business boutique events or when I hear people writing in even today about, you know, they read the book, like you start to realize what you're doing makes an impact. It mm -hmm. matters. Even if you're painting paintings or selling hair bows, it matters what you're doing. And you know, I'm a big fan of the verse, we do our work as unto the Lord. And so you don't have to work in church or nonprofit to make a difference. We make, dif make a difference all day, every day by simply taking care of people through our gifts and talents. So for me, it's, it's about so much more than business. It's, it's about doing what you love. It's about using your gifts and being who God created you to be. And it's about taking care of people in the marketplace. And that's as much of a ministry as anything else out there. Absolutely, love that. Okay, we got some more questions coming in. So I'm gonna jump over here and grab a few of those. Right. Uh, this is one again, or here's one from YouTube. Um, a beautiful horizon ask, what are your thoughts on using something like Kickstarter to start a products business? Great question. Yeah, that's a great tool. It's a great resource. I would just encourage you to do some research on the front end of what makes a successful Kickstarter campaign, because I will tell you, I've known people that have had a lot of success and reached their goal and were able to fund their business to get it off the ground. And I've also talked to some people that didn't. And because they didn't do things well to be successful and didn't meet their goal, it really kind of sucker punched them with the, in the confidence area because they thought, oh man, this idea is a failure. This is never gonna work. Well, that's not true. You're just hmm. using Kickstarter and not meeting your fundraising goal as your only measure of success when that's not necessarily true. So do some research, make sure you know exactly what you're giving to people for the different donation amounts and make sure it's something you really wanna give. That's another thing, if, if you're not careful, if you start just promising the world away, then that's gonna be your part-time job is just mailing all these koozies and books and t-shirts and all this stuff you promised. So do a little research, it's not a bad idea, but make sure that you're up for the commitment and you do it well in order to actually reach your fundraising goal. But it can be a great option for many people. Great answer. Okay, on Facebook, Amy Haywood asks, I feel like often it's about having the next best thing or having a change with every wave of culture or their needs. That is exhausting to me and I feel like I'm always behind the curve. What is realistic in regards to what is needed as, the business, as a business owner to serve your people well? That is a fantastic question and I love the last part of that question where it says, serve your people well. Because the truth is, when you serve your people well, they will come back for more. Um, even if you're in a business like Etsy, for example. Um, several years ago, I went on to Etsy. I found an invitation for, um, it was a, a shower I was hosting for a friend. 
I worked with a graphic designer and she was so fantastic and worked with me so well that every time I go on Etsy for a Christmas card or an invitation, I don't even search the designs. I go straight to her and say, can you design this custom invitation? And I pay about $5 more per item, but I don't have the headache of dealing with new people and Googling and searching and sifting through all these things because she took such great care of me. So take mm. great care of your customers and they will come back. You know, I keep using this as an example, but Dave Ramsey is the company, you know, Ramsey Solutions is where I work. Michael, let's be honest, he's been saying the same thing 25 years, right? <laughs> like cut up the credit cards, get out of debt. Like you can say the same thing, you can do the same thing, but take care of people. And if, as long as you're solving their problems and meeting their needs, they will come back for more. Great, great answer. Okay, from Facebook, Katie Pod asks, this is a great question too, I'm a minimalist, and I don't connect with compulsory com uh, consumption of our culture. So I'm having trouble finding a business idea that fits my minimalistic values. Any tips? Katie, I've got your business idea. Help people become minimalist. Seriously, if you're that passionate about it, I just worked with a woman the other day and I featured her on the Business Boutique podcast. You can search, it's one of the past couple episodes. But she was so passionate about becoming a minimalist that she started blogging about it. Family and friends started coming to her and she built a business helping people declutter and become minimalist because people like me need people like you. So that's one idea, but I would just find a way to create a business. Uh, maybe it's a service-based business. Maybe it's something else where you're not going congruent to your values and trying to get people to consume a bunch of stuff or sell them a bunch of products you don't believe in. Instead, find a way to have an outpouring of your business where you serve people that lines up with your values and your why. But I love hearing you talk about it because even that is a good indicator of what makes you light up. Yeah, that's such a good one, such a creative one. I mean, the truth is Absolutely. you could build a business around anything. Because there are people that are out there that want to declutter, they want to go minimalistic. I know tons of those people but they don't really have a clue or they don't have the time or they don't know how to get out of the, right. you know, the hamster well, wheel and figure it out. Right, well, that's the thing. And when people ask me, is this a uh, good idea? Can this idea make money? Is there a market for this idea? Here's the one question I ask them. And this is a great question for everyone of you tuning in. If you have a business idea or want to start a business, the best thing you can figure out about this idea is what problem are you solving? because that's why we go into business. We go into business not for ourselves and to make money. That's, a, that's certainly a part of it. But you go into business to help people. And when you go into business to help people, you're solving their problem and meeting their needs. And so what problem are you solving? When you figure that out, then it tells you so many other things about your business. For example, when you know your problem that you're solving, you know who the market is, because who has the problem that you're solving? Cluttered people, you're helping them have a minimalist lifestyle. Um, and this also gives you your value proposition because when you know the problem you're solving, that's the thing you're gonna charge for because people are willing to pay for their problems to be solved. So identify what problem you're solving through your business and that's gonna give you so much more important information. And then you can serve the marketplace and know that you can make money. So just think through that and think through what problems you're solving through your business. Excellent, perfect. Okay, I wanna talk about the book for a minute. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the four tiers of business building that you outline in the book? Absolutely. Well, here's what I found in my coaching and research and experience. It's not having too many things to do that overwhelms us. It's not knowing what to do. But the moment we have a plan, the moment we have steps and we have a checklist, like we'll do the work. We're willing to work hard and follow the steps and check off the check boxes and that kind of thing. We just need to know what those steps are. So that's why I wrote the book the way that I did. Cover to cover, it is a step-by-step -step plan. It gives you everything you need to start, run, or grow your business to the level that you want to, to define your version of success and to be able to get there. And so I've kind of designed it like a wedding cake. We've talked about my mom's story of the cake shop being kind of my background in my childhood. And so I designed the, the business plan like a wedding cake with four tiers. The base tier is the most important. This is where you build your foundation. So this is where you start with the end in mind. So you think about your dream and your vision and your goals. And, and when you start with the end in mind, not only does it help you not make so many mistakes along the way, but it prevents you from crossing someone else's finish line. So you build your business to get you where you want to be. So that's the foundation and that will inform all future decisions that you make. And then there's tier two and tier two is where you make your business yours. So you consider your strengths, your values, your money, your time, your schedule, your space, and you want to use your resources in the business and build the business around your life versus the other way around, which as we've said is the best part of going in business for yourself. So tier two is where you really make your business yours. 
tier three is where you get operational. And I'll be honest, this isn't necessarily the fun stuff. This is like policies and payment and platform and that kind of stuff. It's, it's the nuts and bolts. It's how you're going to get up and running. But this is a really important tier because if you can streamline your processes and if you can be really efficient in your setup, you're going to save yourself time and money. And you're going to have more time for the fun stuff that you love to do. And mm. so tier three is where you really uh, get operational. And then the last tier, the topper of the wedding cake is tier four. And that's where you put yourself out there. And that's everything about marketing. And we talk about your target market and your elevator pitch and what language you use and branding and what makes you unique. And it helps you really understand who you are uh, and what your brand represents so that you can reach the right people in the right way. And we talk about how to find your target market and how to be able to reach them and through social media and that type of thing. So cover to cover, it's a plan and it really walks you through uh, what you need to do to start a business. Or like I said, if you're running a business, grow your business at the level that you want to. And I, um, I wanted to be the book to be really interactive. And so at the end of every chapter, there are action items that you fill in. And so mm. when you finish the book, you have a customized plan. So it's, it's, it's very much like a workbook in that way that I want you to interact and put this stuff into practice. That's super. I just love frameworks that help take something that's yeah. complex and demystify it and make it practical. You know, in my own experience in working with aspiring entrepreneurs, I found that so many get fearful of some of the unknowns that are in tiers three and four, things like maybe marketing or setting aside money for taxes or whatever that they never begin. How can people overcome the fear and get started? You know, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, for me, what I coach people to do, Michael, is to just take the first step. So if you have this big idea and you've got all these plans and dreams and it's a five year you know, finish line and all this stuff, that can be overwhelming. That can be intimidating to anyone because out in the future is really, really fuzzy and it's unknown. Like you're saying, there's a lot of yep. unknowns out there. But here's what you do know. You know what you can control today. So what is the lowest hanging fruit in your business? Like take your idea and boil it down to something actionable this week. What is that first step, the lowest hanging fruit, the quickest win? And I want you to do that because when you do that and you have a win and you're successful, it's going to give you the confidence and fuel that next step and then the next step and so on. And one baby step at a time, you're working your way to that five-year goal. You're working your way to that five-year success and plan and big idea is becoming much more practical and realistic. But, you know, it's kind of like I use this example of uh, running. Michael, I like to run, so I have like a thousand running analogies. But if I have a really big hill I'm going to run up, I do not run the hill looking at the top. Like that would overwhelm me. It would seem so far away. Instead, I just look at the steps right in front of me. Just take these steps right in front of me, head down. And then over time, I get to the top and I'm able to look down and go, wow, look at the hill I just climbed. And the same is true in your business. Just look at the steps right in front of you and take those steps. And that will fuel the confidence and push past that fear of the big idea to help you make that big idea much smaller one step at a time. That's so good. Um, I coach a lot of writers, I guess, because of my background in publishing. Sure. But I find that when first-time authors get a book contract, they're excited for a few minutes, and then they're overwhelmed because now they've got to write the book, right? Right. And one of the things I coach them to do, very similar to what you're advising, I say, write the easiest chapter first. Then write the second easiest chapter next. Save that big, ugly, gnarly chapter that you're afraid of till last so that you can get some confidence and momentum, and then you can knock that last chapter out. But so many people uh, kind of take the philosophy of they're gonna eat the frog first, which is good in a sense for overcoming procrastination, but I find that a lot of people get stuck. They're overthinking it, and they're trying to do the hard thing before they got the confidence and the momentum to really succeed. So, well, and momentum I, is so powerful. Like, oh, you know powerful. this. We've seen this in every different industry. Like, whether it's in sports, the team that has the ball, the team that's got the momentum. You know, the Preds are in the playoffs right now, so we've been watching them. The team that has the momentum is the one that can be very, very powerful. There's something in your favor when you've got that momentum and focus. And, you know, uh, we teach people to get out of debt. Dave Ramsey talks about this, where you start with your smallest debt by balance, not by interest rate. Because when you pay off that smallest credit card and you cut it up, you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. And it fuels some momentum for the next one. Research shows you're more likely to stick with a plan when you do it that way, when you have those quick wins, build your confidence, gives you the momentum. Then by the time you get to the toughest chapter or your biggest debt or whatever the biggest step is, you've got so much momentum and so much confidence, nothing's going to stop you. But you've got to build that up by the baby steps. That's a great point. 
Amen. Preach. Okay, we got some more questions, <laughs> and I want to get some of these in. Golly, we're not going to get all of them in, but I'm going to get some of them. Uh, Facebook, Artie Sharma asks, what's that one question you would ask someone who has been in business for a while but is feeling stuck? Well, I know we've already talked about this. So I don't want to feel like I'm cheating by going back to this. But I would say, what's your why? Because if you've been in business a long time, you may have lost focus of that and lost sight of that. And you feel like, you know what, this is the day-to-day -day grind. It doesn't matter. Why am I doing this? And if you can refocus on why you're doing it and who you're serving and why this is important to you, it's going to hopefully fuel that energy and excitement. And, and you know, I even encourage people, write it down. You know, post it on your computer or make a graphic and print it out and put it in your office or in your car. Just continually having that reminder and then also talk to your customers. When you talk to your customers and they tell you how much you made their birthday party because they had your cake and it was this incredible cake or they felt great uh, going to this baby shower and they were giving a gift of a handmade dress that you sewed or uh, they read a blog post that changed their day. If you can't get excited about the people that they're, you're changing their life, then it may be tough to think about the business that you're in. You may be in the wrong business, but a lot of times just refocusing on your why and the people you're serving will give you that energy and that boost when you're kind of in the grind and feeling stuck. Because we all get there. I get there totally. plenty of days. Uh, but just refocusing will help you kind of re-energize re re yourself. Yeah, I keep those customer testimonials in Evernote so that when I get stuck yes. and I reconnect with my why, it's like a boost of energy. Okay, this is a That's funny right. comment. Uh, on Facebook, Lance Cook said, my wife has been reading your book, Christy. I'm about to take it from her. <laughs> That's awesome. I okay. love it. That's awesome. Here's another one. This is from Clay Patterson. Clay said, uh, my product is advice, like Andy Andrews. Should I write a book first, or how should I get started? You know, that's a great, that's a great question. There, as we're talking about, there are so many different ways to make an impact. So for you, uh, you first want to identify what's the lowest hanging fruit. So how can you begin to hone your skills, uh, give that advice, coach people, teach people? Is it through a blog? Is it a podcast? Is it a, a webinar? You know, how can you start to help people? Because I will encourage you, I would do something as the on-ramp to the book because two reasons. One, you're going to hone your skills, your storytelling skills. You're going to gather more stories. You're going to build out your ideas that by the time you're ready to write the book, those ideas are better. The quality is higher because you spend a little time working on those things. You know, I put the book out this spring. I had been working with women and gathering stories and hearing their, their struggles for four years uh, that I was kind of building this idea of. Now, you don't have to wait four years, but certainly have an on-ramp before you just go out and write a book because the quality will be higher. But the second reason is this. You'll build a demand. As you serve people through your podcast or your blog or your coaching or whatever you're going to do before you write the book, you're going to build this demand that when you come out with a book, people are like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to buy it because you've served them and you've kind of uh, branded yourself as an expert in this space, whatever that space you're in. So it, it serves two purposes. It's going to help you become better uh, through experience and, and crafting the content and the stories and that type of thing. That's also going to build the demand in the marketplace. So maybe give yourself an on-ramp. Now, there's not a perfect time here. You can say, I'm going to do it for six months or I'm going to do it for 18 months. Uh, that's mm -hmm. really up to you, and that's a personal choice. But I would take a stepping stone before writing the book. And that's just from experience. I think the quality of my book was so much better because I had those stories crafted and cultivated over time. I just think the quality is going to be better, and people will be ready for it by the time you put it out there. So true. I found the same thing. Um, Carmen Cook on Facebook said, uh, Christy, what does that quote behind you say? I love finding out what different words inspire people. I had to turn around. <laughs> uh, more is caught than taught. So Rachel Cruz helps people with uh, parenting and money. She has Smart Money, Smart Kids, her best-selling book. And she talks about more is caught than taught. But that's true even in business. You know, I was talking about this when we first started with my mom. She didn't teach me how to be a businesswoman. She lived it. And uh, I caught it. <laughs> that's fantastic. Great quote. Um, okay, last question. And this is from Periscope. Somebody asked, how do you begin to get other people to notice what you offer them? Big question. That is a big question. I'll tell you, you start putting yourself out there and it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you may have a big opportunity to speak or uh, someone you collaborate with in the blogging world that can give you a boost or a spike, but the best thing you can do is post consistent, 
consistent content, consistent value for your customers, whether that's on social media or a blog or, or an email newsletter, whatever way that you're broadcasting your business. And, and I talk about this in marketing in the book, but there are a bazillion resources for you on how to market. And you can market a variety of ways. Uh, I have a podcast. Uh, Michael has this. He has his blog. We have multifaceted platforms to be able to market. And there's not one thing that's like, oh, that's the thing. That's the way to get yourself out there. Michael, would you agree? Like, it's a combination of a lot of different efforts, right? Yeah, totally. And I just think you start with what you know. Don't get overwhelmed. There's so many great avenues to market yourself today, most of which are free. So, you know, don't wait to get it perfect to get started. Just do what you know and get started that way and start getting the word out. I'll tell you, I, and I wrote about this in my book, Platform. I think the best way to get noticed is start by creating a wow product or a wow service that gets you word of mouth. Advertising can't buy that. Social media can't buy that. The only thing that gets that is when people are delighted with your product or your service. So that's the place to start. Would you agree with that too? Absolutely. And you can be intentional to incentivize word of mouth marketing. So I have some people mm -hmm. that are fantastic on Instagram where uh, uh, one of my friends, Jake of Jake's Bake, he has a delivery cookie company and he incentivizes people to post pictures of them and their cookies, hashtag Jake's, Jake's Bake, and they tag him. And so you get people talking about it. You know, at our events, we say, share your takeaways from each session with hashtag business boutique. You know, Michael, when we kicked off this webinar, we said, share this, share this video. You know, I love showing people behind the scenes of how we do what we do because we're doing the same thing we're telling you to do. So certainly have something amazing people want to talk about, but then give them a little nudge. Be like, okay, if you share yep. this, you know, maybe you're entered to win a contest or a coupon of 20% off or something where you're activating your tribe. And when they're pleased, they're talking about it for you. Because just like Michael said, that's the best testimonial, the best marketing you can have. And it's free. Fantastic. I can't believe we're out of time, but we are. But Christy, do you have any final thoughts that you would share with the person who's thinking about launching out as an entrepreneur, besides buying your book, which I'm going to tell them to do in a minute. But apart from that, what would you encourage them to do? What would be your final thoughts? Well, I'll tell you, a few years ago, you know, my husband and I were having the conversations about ready to start a family, and we just knew we were ready, which is just, any of you that are parents, you know that's a joke. Like, you're never ready, right? You're never ready for kids, and the same is true in business. You're never ready ready to start a business. The truth is in parenting or in business and life, you're gonna learn the most by doing. You're gonna learn yep. the most on the job. So get out there and get moving. Try some stuff and see what sticks. Fall down, get back up, and give yourself grace to push past it and keep going. Because I promise you this, you're gonna learn the most by doing. So get out there and get moving. Get trying and get going. Fantastic. Chrissy, thank you so much. And thank you guys for joining us. If you haven't done so already, Please pick up a copy of Christy's new book, Business Boutique, A Woman's Guide for Making Money, Doing What She Loves. And you can get a copy on Amazon at michaelhyatt.com slash businessboutique. And yes, that's an affiliate link, but it'll take you directly to the page. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. I look forward to talking with you next week, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. I'm going to be interviewing CEO and sports agent Molly Fletcher, who is hailed by CNN as the female Jerry Maguire about the game-changing power of small moments of fearlessness. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again.